Hello, my name is Jason Hill. I'm with the La Mesa Model Railroad Club in San Diego, California, inside the Model Railroad Museum in the Casa de Balboa. Today we're standing here at Caliente in the middle of the 7,500 square foot layout, which is modeling Tachapi Pass. And we'll be looking around the layout and following a train over the pass. We originally started in a building called Nebo Hall in La Mesa in the 1960s as a group of teenagers. In 1978, Nebo Hall was condemned by the city of La Mesa and it was torn down. The club was looking for a new home and in 1978 as well, this building, the Casa de Balboa, was destroyed by arson. Next door, the San Diego Model Railroad Club was in the House of Charm and it was also condemned. The rebuilt Casa de Balboa was then looking for tenants. The two clubs were able to form the San Diego Model Railroad Museum as an umbrella to deal with the city and this club has moved into this space about 35 years ago. In 1982, the club opened to the public and was running trains on a regular basis. The La Mesa Club was designed from the beginning to model a real place. The layout in Nebo Hall was a fictitious layout based loosely over the Tahoe Pass where there was never actually a railroad built. Over the years, the club members felt a draw to prototype or prototype operation the members were also heavily involved in timetable and train order operations, visiting places like Mission Tower and various other places around Southern California where train orders were still being written. This had a large impact on the membership. The resulting layout design built at San Diego Model Railroad Museum was originally envisioned to include a 5,000 square foot basic footprint and a 2,500 square foot mezzanine level, creating a full second deck over about half of the layout space. The entire line, as modeled, is about 30 scale miles. This is about 1,700 feet of main line, plus secondary trackage and some dual track main lines. Okay, the prototype that was chosen for the La Mesa Club to model in the San Diego Model Railroad Museum was going to be the Tatchby Pass, where the Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe join at Bakersfield and then separate again at Mojave for joint trackage rights over the pass. This area sees one of the heaviest concentrations of trains operating in Southern California. The layout was originally designed to have 24 analog block control selection switches. In 2001 and 2, with the layout constructing the upper mezzanine level, the layout was converted to DCC with the North Coast Engineering System. Here we see extra 3666 West departing Bakersfield bound for Roseville with a mixed freight. Here at Bakersfield, trains coming off the San Joaquin Valley Division would get heavier power to head up over the Tatchby Pass to Mojave. The models here in the Bakersfield area are entirely scratch built. The ice deck, the roundhouse, the carpentry shop, Station, Pullman Shed, REA Buildings, and Company Village are all scratch built off of prototype plans. Here we see the 4217 being turned on the table in anticipation of being coupled in as a helper on an eastward freight train. Once the engines are turned, they move forward to the servicing track and then they are considered ready for service and will await the road crews to pick them up. Today we'll be following Southern Pacific's 804 out of Bakersfield Yard. The lead engine consist will be the 6203, 8103, 8102, and 6202. Helper engine will be the 4217, an AC-10 class locomotive. The consist will be 51 cars and a caboose. Here we see the 6203 moving eastward out of the ready track and down to the west yard lead in preparation for sawing back out onto the main switching lead and then running down track six. Here we see the 4217 moving eastward out of the roundhouse's ready track and then backing onto the 20s tracks where the rear of the train is.
Here we see the 4217 moving up to couple to the rear of the train while the F units are coupling to the front of the train. Here we see Southern Pacific 2nd 806 departing Bakersfield and crossing Mount Vernon Avenue as it moves to the eastward main track. Here we see the 2nd 806 heading out of Bakersfield through McGundan and the Orange Citrus Groves and its way to Edison. Here at McGundan is the junction point to the Arvin branch, which is a large potato packing district and is also the home to the largest table grape producer in the world. At the left, we see Arvin and Gorgio in the distance on the Arvin branch. There are 95 car spots for perishable loading of potatoes and table grapes out here on the branch as well. On the right side of the aisle is the end of the branch at Taft for the Sunset Railway, which rejoins the Southern Pacific Main Line at Bakersfield at Kern Junction. Here we see 2nd 806 coming through Edison. Edison is a packing district for citrus products for the Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe, about 15 miles out of Bakersfield. There will be about 80 packing sheds out here for packing of oranges and various other citrus products. Road switchers working out of Bakersfield will come out and do the work and then head back. Here we see 2nd 806 climbing over Sandcut Hill and dropping down into the end of double track at Bina. Here we are at Bina, and this is the end of double track coming out of Bakersfield. There's fairly high running speeds, and in 1922, the Southern Pacific built the double track out of Bakersfield to keep trains moving faster. One of the tricks that they were able to employ in various places was to use spring switches in which the sp switch automatically springs back to a normal position to route a train onto the track that they normally want a train to enter if they are facing point to that switch. At this place, uh, we have the eastward main track over here, and it springs through the main track switch, which is normally set for westward traffic to enter the westward main track. The center siding is normally set for the eastward main track and any train exiting the siding on the east end, which is where we're looking at now, will spring through both sets of spring switches. So the car that I'm pushing here pushes through the spring switch and if I go backwards, you'll notice that I go down onto the eastward main track. I'm not touching any of the switch controls at this point and the car, like I said, switched over already. It rolls through this switch and the switch point switched over automatically and now I bring the car back and now it goes down the westward main track. Here we see 2nd 806 crossing over what is called the Lionel Bridge just east of Bina. On the model railroad we also have a short loop which allows us to keep trains in front of the public and not run all the way into Bakersfield. This loop is connected just west of the siding at Illman. And as we come into Illman with the train, we see the 1953 alignment of the main line where they have built in a extended section of ballast here, the, where the original main line originally came up the bottom of the canyon. And in the first 15 years, they had multiple floods that wiped out that section of the railroad. They built the new line way up on the side of the hill. And then over the later years, they extended new fills out across to straighten the main line out. At the east end of Illman, we're modeling the 1967 realignment with another section of fill that made the siding longer. Here at the east end of Illman, the track on the right is the rebuilt main line from about 1900. On the track on the left is the 1967 rebuild 
which straightened the main line out, and that was in effect until 1982 when a major flood wiped out this whole area. Here we see Second 806 entering the west portal of Tunnel 1 Half. Tunnel 1 Half was built in about 1900 when the Southern Pacific got tired of rebuilding the railroad as they had it built up the bottom of the canyon and after about 15 years there were multiple washouts. The replaced grade was done after the earlier washouts and here we see the train exiting the east portal of Tunnel 1 Half and as the train comes up past the first grade signal, you will notice in the bottom of the canyon the old right-of-way trestle bents and bridge abutments. Here we are at Caliente as a pair of RSD-5s drift down off the hill. At Caliente there was a water tank for watering steam helpers, a depot, corrals, and a small town. Over the years this was a hotbed of activity as the Southern Pacific built the Southern Pacific's pass over Tatchby Pass. For several years this was the end of track as the railroad was basically stuck in the bottom of the Caliente Valley. Once William Hood came in and discovered the way to navigate and survey a pass using the Tatchby Loop and multiple S-curves and about 15 extra miles of track, this town basically died as it, the wagon roads and stagecoach stop was superseded by the railroad's completion in the late 1800s. Here we see Second 806 swinging around the horseshoe at Caliente and beginning its main climb up the Tatchby grade. There are about six horseshoe curves on Tatchby Pass that allow the line to continue to climb steeply but use very little actual crow's flight distance while they're climbing. Here, second 806 approaches the first grade signal above Caliente and approaches Tunnel 1. In 1952, a 7.5 earthquake struck the Tatchbees and the fill that you see basically collapsed and these hungry people from Train 55 had to hike across a swinging section of ties about 30 feet in the air to get down to Caliente and try to find some food in the middle of the night. Here we see second 806 climbing to Allard through tunnel two 
and meeting the Santa Fe Extra 225 West at Allard. The 225 West has a Santa Fe Western Pacific Great Northern empty lumber train heading back to the interchange with the Western Pacific at Mormon Yard in Stockton. Once the second 806 clears at Allard, Santa Fe Extra 225 West departs and heads through Tunnel 2 with the SWG. Here we see second 806 approaching Beaville. Beaville has an emergency water tank as well as some of the section gangs and foremen for maintaining the tracks. There's also a small ranch house here and above this we enter the area that was damaged by the 1952 earthquake. In July 1952, the White Wolf Fault slipped, causing a 7.5 earthquake between Tunnels 3 and 4. Tunnel 3 was shortened by several hundred feet. Tunnel 4 was completely abandoned and bypassed around its downhill side. Tunnel 5 was the worst damaged and was bypassed for a time with a shoe fly, and then the line was realigned back through Tunnel 5. Tunnel 6 was completely removed. Tunnel 4 in our model is representing the cut where the shoe fly was built around the outside of the damaged tunnel and the inside of the lining, which normally would be covered with dirt, is exposed. And you can see here in the model was done with very fine plaster castings, including very fine rebar detail. The train is now passing through cliff which is about 800 feet higher than Caliente, which is only two miles away. The railroad snakes through the Tatchby Mountains, climbing between Caliente and Cliff to gain this altitude using about eight miles of extra rail. This allows the railroad to maintain its 2% grade profile over the pass. Our models also use a 2% grade, and in the steepest portions, it's 2.34% at way long. The trains are now proceeding up out of cliff through tunnels 7 and 8. Here we see the train entering the Tunnel 8 helix, which adds another six inches in altitude. Tunnel 8 also has two reversing loops for public display operation. Here we see the train climbing into Rowan. Rowan is a double siding. And this is also the beginning of the upper level of the layout, where a lot of this section is still under construction. 
As you can see by the train traversing the area, there's plywood where roads are being built. Mountains will be soon being formed. There's a clay model here of the three-dimensional sculpture of how the mountains are looking. And our scenery department folks are actually debating and then changing and continuing to re-sculpt this as they're debating exactly how best to interpret all of the research that we have, which is thousands of photographs, USGS survey maps, and even things such now as Google Earth where we can zoom a camera down and get a perspective view on the prototype mountains in full three dimensions. Woodford is the upper station on the north side of the Tatchby Pass that was equipped with water columns for watering of steam engines. Cab Ford type locomotives would have to get water either at Caliente or at Woodford. Woodford also had two sidings. The number two siding was next to the station and the no longer number one siding was down towards the creek. The train slows, preparing to take water in the helper at water column number one. Cab forwards in service on Tatchby would use their 22,000 gallons of water in about one and three quarter hours. The feed water pump system could use 12,000 gallons of water an hour. After about an hour and a half, the engines must take water before they continue. Whistling off, second 806 now departs Woodford with its helper full of water. Here we see 2nd 806 climbing over 5th crossing, heading for the Tatchby Loop at Waylong. 5th crossing is 200 vertical feet below Tunnel 10, which is only a mile away. William Hood, using civil engineering tricks, as well as using the small hill out in the middle of the Waylong Loop, was able to circumnavigate the hill, adding an extra mile of track to keep the track at a 2% grade. Second 806 is hurrying to get to Waylong at this point because second 24 will soon be passing second 806 at Waylong. Here we see 2nd 806 taking the siding at Waylong in anticipation of being passed by 2nd 24. Our model of the Tatchby Loop includes Tunnel 9, which is where the track crosses over itself. On the prototype, this is a separation of 88 feet. On the model, we've been able to achieve about 66 feet with a 2.34% grade, which is steeper than prototype.
Second 24 is running one hour late on number 24's timetable schedule. With Christmas drawing near, Second 24 is moving large quantities of holiday mail and express traffic. With the track clear again, second 806 prepares to depart way long. Here we see the train moving up through Marcel, which is a triple track section of the railroad. There's a westward and an eastward siding here, and the track that the train is moving on is the main track. So here we have an example of one of our scenery making techniques, and it's the first time we've used it here at La Mesa. This is tunnel 14, which is above Marcel. There's a very large ridge line that the railroad punches through with a single tunnel and then following three ridges each have their own tunnel as well. In this case, one of our members went into the canyon below the tunnel on the west side and took a photograph towards the west portal of number 14 tunnel. The ridge line above is silhouetted against the sky and in this rig we have set up a piece of transparency here in which the tunnel at this point lines up with the tunnel on the layout which is here and we have been working to get the ridge line to match up because of some other constraints with the layout space we have decided to raise the profile slightly but as you can see here when I reveal the layout behind you can see it go back and forth here the scenery here as well is um, built heavy we basically build our benchwork and our scenery to be able to be walked on. It is also as well a security wall to keep uh, unwanted people out. And in most cases, most model railroads are going to be using normal chicken wire. This is actually a stucco screen and we build everything very heavy and many parts of the layout where we have the hard shell scenery done, you can pound on it with your fist and your fist will hurt afterwards. This is an artist's rendition of Tunnel 14 with a train coming out and this is the tunnel portal that we were just looking at with the transparency. Here the train is coming out. We had that transparency hanging here. This is the ridge that was in silhouette against the sky and above it, this is a rather unique layout design feature of the way we are building the La Mesa Club uh, layout. The Summit Y is actually inside of this bulge on the upper level uh, on the back side of the scene. So what we have is the 
backdrop come around and there's a very shallow relief here above the tunnel and there's also a duck under into the uh, other side there and of course the railroad comes out the alternative was to try to keep it as one scene um, which didn't really work out uh, although we are staying more as one scene as opposed to keeping a uh, full Florida ceiling uh, fascia basically going all the way up and dividing the scene into two completely separate scenes. So this one little strip of land around the ridge actually kind of connects the two scenes together. Over here we have some other additional photographs for our records, or I should say from our records, showing Tunnel 17's east, west and east portal, Tunnel 16's west and east portal, and Tunnel 15's west and east portal. So in this section of the railroad, above T Tatchby Loop right now, we're still building the layout. The layout's been under construction for 35 years already, and the layout's probably going to be at least another 15 years of completion. The scenery department right now is working from Woodford and working west down through Rowan. As the train's working its way up here through uh, Marcel and the upper tunnels, which are obviously tunnels 14 through 17, and up to Cable, we can see up here on the wall as the backdrop department is starting to sketch in the profiles of where these mountain shapes are going to be. And here's the equipment coming along. We also have lots of uh, additional materials such as printed maps that we've done. And that helps us again with our scenery profiles and even such things as finding where trees belong. Yeah. Some of our members have uh, expressed interest in doing things as scenery and bench work. Um, some of them are, have skills in welding. And so, for example, here we're actually on the upper level now using a hybrid of steel bench work and three quarter inch plywood. The uh, layout basically, as I mentioned before, allows for members to be able to walk on the right of way and also along most of our roads. If this was wood, this would be about this thick. And with the steel, we're able to make it about one half, about one third to one quarter as thick. And this is allowing us to have additional trackage in close proximity vertically, which normally you would not be able to do on a layout such as this. The uh, membership right now is around 100. It seems to stay around there. The people actively building that are specialists in their areas, the department heads, are generally about 10 in number, and sometimes up to about 12, maybe 15. Um, we have youth members that are joining and then going off to college. Usually people start coming back around 30, 35, 40, somewhere in there and staying around until they retire and sometimes becoming more involved when they're retired. The uh, operations department has been going strong now for about 20 years. We continue to develop our more prototypical operating sessions. Uh, 1950s era is especially fun because we get to do timetable and train order. Uh, during this video, we've been referring to these trains as they would be during our timetable train order sessions for the 1950s. We also have done 1980s and post-2000 operating sessions as well. I'm not sure when those next sessions are going to be scheduled. Our 1950s sessions are regularly scheduled every two to three months throughout the year. We usually move forward about six days in 1950s, and I should mention that each of the sessions that we do it lasts for 12 hours in each day. We start at 8 a.m. and we go to 8 p.m. and then we start the next day as if it was continuing at 8 p.m. and going to 8 a.m. We just switch 12 hours. So each weekend that we operate, we move forward on the 1950s era clock 24 hours. This is rather interesting as if you think about it, right now we're in December 1952 during the operating sessions and to get forward far enough to be using something like SD9s in 1954 it will take us about 40 years of operating sessions at the current rate that we're doing things. So we'll be continuing to use cab forward such as 4217 and the standard F units on the front of all of our trains for many years yet to come. You may have noticed in the various shots around the layout, control panels such as this one. This panel is working as our east end staging yard panel, and on it we have various controls. The red ones are basically track switch selection. The indicator lights show us which track has been selected. 
the illuminated ones here and here are indicating booster power controlling this section of the whole yard, or I should say actually this is a main track, so this one is controlling this one, easily lets us know from long ways away and shallow angles if the track is powered and we don't have to actually be able to see the switch. Sidings such as these, we can turn on and off for their individual selectors. To line a main um, yard switch, such as this group here, we can simply press the button and the switches will align and sh show us that they have changed. Some of the switches here and here are far enough out in the field that I can control them from this main panel at this point, or I can walk down and use a more local panel and control them. Basically, these are dual control switches. So if I wanted to throw this cross over here, I could push the reverse key and it will go red, showing me that there's a track not lined for the main track. Pushing N again brings the switch back to normal, which is the main route. So here we have the upper tangents of the layout. Basically, we have a scene here that's about 125 feet long. The Bakersfield below us is about the same length. Over here on the top, we have Tehachapi and Summit. Over here, we have Monolith and several other stations down there. The track then goes out around the public aisle, back down on this level, which is um, an intermediate level, dropping back down into Mojave, which is at this level. Down here, we have some staging yards and the branch lines to Trona and Cyril's. And over here, we have additional staging. Here we are at Tachpi. Tachpi is the end of double track coming out of Mojave. Basically west of Tachapi Station here is single track. Tachapi has three sidings, two of which are double-ended. These were for holding trains, waiting for orders to proceed onto the single track under timetable and trade order, or waiting for the dispatcher to line up the CTC machines controls of the signals and switches against opposing trains. Here the 6203 will be setting out the 4217 as a helper at Summit which is a 4,000 foot pass, which is the main pass going between Bakersfield and Los Angeles. The 4217 has been directed to return to Bakersfield, so after cutting out it will be turned on the Y and then drift back to catch P-Siding and wait for orders. Here, second 806 backs down to the rear of the train after the 4217 cut away. 4217 will now be turning itself on the Y and then waiting for the freight train to clear for it to be able to drift crossover and head back on the westward track. After charging the air, second 806 departs Summit. Here we see second 806 passing Monolith with the 5235 working as the KI switcher at Monolith. Here we see second 806 dropping down after passing through the summit and Eric past Cameron and turning around and coming back through Warren on our model which then goes into partially hidden trackage for another 125 feet to Mojave. Here we see second 806 arriving at Mojave and because this train is an express perishable train of PFE reefers heading to Colton, this train does not plan on being worked at Mojave. The train cruises through on the main and continues its way through Lancaster, Vincent, 
Soledad Canyon to Los Angeles. Well, I hope you enjoyed your brief trip around Tatchby Pass. I know this layout is very large and it takes a little while, but I hope you've all made it to the end of the video. If anyone would like more information about the club, you can visit our website at lamesaclub.com. And for more information on our operating sessions, which is the main focus of this layout's whole reason for existence, you can do that at opsontachapee.com.